start us off. Uh, we have Brian, um, our, uh, you know, one of our uh, investors, friends, and, uh, you know, somebody who we really look up to who's going to be moderating the next session. Uh, we also have three of the top uh, uh, VCs in the AIML space. Uh, very excited to have all three of them. Uh, maybe Brian can actually go ahead and do some introductions or have them introduce themselves. And I think this is one of the more exciting sessions that we've ever had in this uh, series of conferences we do. So super excited for it. Yeah, thank you for having us all, Bindu. I'm happy to take over. Um, great to meet everyone out there in the audience virtually. I'm, as Bindu mentioned, I'm Brian Offit. I'm an investor uh, here at Index Ventures where I focus on investments in AIML and kind of all things technical. And I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel of fellow investors, um, some of whom we've invested aside, both in Abacus and otherwise. Uh, first off, we have David Kahn, who's a partner over at Co2 Management. Next, we have George Matthew over at Insights Partners, Insight Partners, and finally, we have Matt Turk over at Firstmark. Uh, I could give lengthy introductions to each of these folks, but I figure uh, it's better coming from the, the source. So uh, I'd love it if everyone could go around and perhaps give the audience a little bit of background on yourselves, maybe starting with you, David. Yeah, happy to start, and, and great to meet everyone. And Brian, thanks for hosting. Uh, it's been fun to invest with a bunch of the folks here uh, in a number of companies in IML. so excited to, to get, dig into the conversation. Uh, we've invested a number of businesses in the data stack, and I think we've been spending a lot more time thinking through how, how kind of data gets used for more and more interesting use cases. If you think about kind of BI and charts as kind of the original use case, how does that evolve into kind of more sophisticated applications? So excited to dig in with, with everybody here. And maybe just going in order, we'll, uh, we'll jump over to George next. Hey, everyone. Just uh, glad to be on this conversation with actually some of my closest friends in the data space. Um, just more recently, before coming into the venture capital world, I've been an operator for a good 20 plus years in data analytics, ML, AI, and uh, decided to make the switch in the middle of COVID to becoming a venture capitalist. And it's been certainly a busy one, but um, look forward to this conversation today. And Matt, you want to round us out? Yeah, uh, super happy to be here as well. I'm uh, Matt. I'm a partner at Firstmark, New York-based firm. Uh, we do early stage seed and Series A, uh, and I'm a huge uh, fan and supporter of the overall data, AI, and machine learning ecosystem. I invest in the space. I uh, write about the space. I do things like annual landscapes um, of the space, and I uh, also run data-driven NYC, which uh, started as a, as a little meetup and has become uh, a, a large, uh, actually the largest uh, data and AI community of its kind in the, in the country, which has been a fantastic source of, uh, uh, you know, meeting people and making a lot of friends. So uh, excited to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, super excited for this conversation. I guess to kick things off, um, just to give the audience a little bit of a foundation that we can hopefully build on throughout this conversation. Uh, it'd be great to hear about how you all think about um, investment strategies, number one. What do you look for in an investment? Uh, first, more generally, and then perhaps what's specific to AI that might be different from when you're looking at other investments in fintech or infrastructure that lies outside of AI? And maybe just to drive the conversation to make things a little less Zoom awkward, I'll, uh, I'll say, George, why don't you kick us off on this one and I'll round robin it on other future questions. Yeah, sure, right. So when we've been looking at Insight, uh, most of the recent investments, particularly in data analytics, ML, AI, we've, we've taken a little bit more of a priority and focus on like, what are some of those key areas where there's a real need for call it the, the users, the day-to-day -day users, uh, ML practitioners, data scientists, to be able to get just better leverage out of tools um, that they're using on a day-in, day-out basis. So a great example is something that David and I kind of focused on from an investment standpoint this past year, which most everyone probably in this room knows about is weights and biases, right? So when we co-led the weights and biases round, a lot of that focus, at least for the ML practitioner themselves, just having a strong experience when it comes to hyperparameter tuning, version controls, being able to handle everything related to just experiment tracking. That was a very very unique, compelling experience on one part of the overall ML ops tool chain. And so what we tried to do at Insight is to ensure like these best experiences were emerging in call it the category of now what we you know decided is 
MLOps as a as a you know collective here, but ultimately these are very very specific experiences that we're really targeting. Um, you know the key personas of kind of building that MLOps tool chain accordingly, and that's where Inside at least took a strong position, uh, literally in this sort of build out of that MLOps tool chain and set of investments, particularly in the last eighteen months. Yeah, Matt, David, feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll just direct the first question or the first uh, <laughs> responder <laughs> and first let responder. people jump in from there. I mean, to build off George, and it's been fun to work together on weights and biases. You know, what I would say is one of the things that's interesting about this space is the end practitioners are incredibly discerning. And I think customers are always really discerning, but the customers in this space are really discerning. And I think there's a lot of, you know, you sort of think about all the tools that get launched every year, a few of them catch on and thinking about why those tools catch on, I think is really interesting. And thinking about the leverage that those practitioners provide, you think about the, the spectrum of consumer investments, things like Uber, like every person can relate with an Uber product, something like Workday, where there's kind of like a unique practitioner in the organization. I think AI is the ultimate extreme of that, where you have these builders who are building experiences that are ultimately gonna scale and leverage across massive organizations. And those people have, have their time is very valuable. Uh, they, they get paid a lot of money. Uh, and I think enabling them to have the most leverage is something that all of these companies are striving to do. And as we look to make investments in this space, the easiest way to make decisions is to look at what those practitioners are choosing and they're voting with their feet. Uh, and I think that ultimately leads to, to sort of the, the best outcomes. Yep. I guess, uh, you know, what one uh, interesting question maybe at the beginning of this conversation is, uh, okay, what is an AI startup, right? Like we're all investors in, in AI startup. What does that actually mean? And, and the way I tend to think about it, like a simplified version is like there's basically two categories. There's one category, which is tools. Uh, so developer tools, platforms uh, that basically help people deploy AI in their companies. And there's a, a different category, a separate category, which is um, AI apps, uh, which are basically uh, companies that use AI to build an application that serves a, an end market. And, and, and those are actually fairly different in terms of like how they behave and uh, what people like us look for. Uh, and, and what they what those companies become over time. I, I, I'm actually uh, equally active in both. Uh, like sort of half of my portfolio is really like AI apps, uh, companies that you know. Frankly, the end uh, customers sometimes don't even know need to know that there is AI at the at the heart of it. Um, but uh, you know, without AI, they would not be able to to do what they do. So I, I, I completely agree with what George and David just mentioned around AI tools. For me, in AI apps, just to talk about that category, since it hasn't been um, uh, talked about uh, yet, I I, I, um, I look for mostly um, companies, you know, the right teams, and we can talk we can talk about what that means. But companies that actually leverage AI uh, to do what AI does best. So like a use case where AI. Uh, enables those companies to deliver uh, either an experience that would not be possible without AI or 10x better than whatever else exists. Yeah, yeah and it, it's interesting. I was just going to say that well, as, as Matt just made that comment, uh, Brian, when we start to see this market evolve, like I, I think Matt's also right, like most of the like first and early investments call it in, in AI companies have been on these vertical applications, right? I mean, that's where you know, the predominant focus was, you know, for a good part of like, you know, 2016 onward. And I think it was only in the last sort of 18 months that we now started to see a repeatability in terms of, you know, what we were calling, calling out these like very specific experiences that were more tools oriented for the practitioners, for the data scientists that have emerged where there is more call it investability in sort of the tools and platforms. But, but, but Matt's absolutely right. There is call it two opportunities here, right? Uh, both the application as well as the tooling. I yeah. think we think about it very, oh, go ahead, David. No, go ahead, Brian, sorry about that. Oh, I was gonna ask a follow-up question. You know, we think about things very similarly um, at Index in terms of splitting into those two categories. Uh, but one of the things I think is really interesting, David, that you touched on that was a question I was very excited to ask in this panel, just to hear everyone's opinion, is, um, you know, you, you mentioned that there are certain tools within a given category that will break out, right? And that you kind of look at what developers decide upon as the standard as a group. And Matt, if you look at the market maps that you've made over the past few years of this landscape, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, both from a number of categories perspective, but also for any given category, the number of players within that category. So I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, maybe start with you, David, since you, you brought this up and then we can spread it to the whole group. But how do you think about identifying which one of the tools is going to be the breakout one when there might be 
eight, 10 in a category. Um, you know, given that's kind of, I feel like one of the fundamental challenges of investing in this space right now. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge. I think one thing that's interesting is it's, it's always been a challenge in every innovation cycle. There's a great book, The Engines That Move Markets, about the original innovations of like the light bulb and all these things that people kind of think, oh, Thomas Edison just came up with this and we have these great innovations. But actually at the time, everyone was trying to build these things. And the same is true for railroads and, uh, and other, other sort of innovations. So, you know, I think in this, in this space specifically, there's probably more interesting moats that get built over time, right? And so in AI, you actually have real data moats. So if you can acquire a proprietary data set and that data asset compounds over time, I think there's great businesses that are built where you actually have a data advantage over your peers. Um, and I think as we look at really early stage companies before there's real traction, right? And before there's real adoption, I think we focus on, is this a sophisticated team that's gonna be able to build something new? Um, and is the product direction something that the end users want? And I think that's something you can start the hypothesis test fairly early in the startup as you talk to customers and understand what exactly is the solution they want and, and how do you build against it? And look, I think we're going to definitely see a consolidation in this space over time. Not every company that's, that's launching here is going to work. And um, I think ultimately execution is going to divide the winners from the losers. And, and we don't know yet who those are. Any thoughts from Matt, George? I think David hit it on the head. Uh, there's not a whole lot to add to that. It's um, it's it's very early innings of the ball game right now, Ryan. And so each of these subcategories as they're forming, what we're now seeing is even just the sheer fact that like any one of us moves in as a potential investor starts to create uh, additional interest in all the you know sort of competitive products that might be in that, you know, sub-segment of the market, right? Um, I definitely saw a little bit of this this past year. So I, I think in reality, none of that matters. I think what really matters is just a, a enormous focus on, you know, the customers that they're serving, enormous ability to, you know, deliver a great experience. And that's what's going to kind of drive, you know, the long-term success of any subcategory leader in the space. So that is to be written out in the next several innings of the ball game. It's, it's super early right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, someone asked me, uh, last week, actually my biggest prediction for data and AI startups in 2022. And I was like, the consolidation I think is going to be the name of the year because you have a lot of companies who are two, three years old, who are early from a monetization perspective. And so they're kind of venture subsidized. But once all those companies are starting to try to meaningfully monetize, there's only so much budget to grab from. And so I think there's going to be certain revenue gravity wells that you can pull from. And unless you're right next to that gravity well, uh, you're going to have a bit of a hard time. And there's just going to be a lot of people trying to pull from that same, same pool. Um, sort of one of the, like, I mean, just to jump into that, like, uh, you know, I don't know if that's uh, too much of an inside baseball type of conversation. And I don't know if that's interesting to people, but um it's, it's actually sort of interesting like, I, I completely agree like it's a logical conclusion there should be um there should be a consolidation like we have all these categories that appeared in the in the landscape like over the last you know year or 18 months like that nobody had really ever heard about and that like overnight became like overcrowded like whether you think about uh, i don't know like reverse ctl or data labeling or like this like you know all the things right and um and you know absolutely there's just like too many companies and they're going to need to consolidate but like at the same time like m what i've seen and i don't know what you guys have seen is that yes there is already some level of consolidation the issue is that uh, is, is is us basically it's like venture capitalists right like we, we keep funding um those companies and and you know they, they get to do the next round and all of us uh, are on the boards of companies that have a lot of cash in the bank and would want to acquire those companies. Uh, but like those companies said no, because they, they prefer to raise a, a series B rather than getting acquired for what they feel is not, uh, you know, the maximum outcome. Maybe that's a good thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of innovation happening in the space. I think one of the fortunate parts about this capital market environment is a lot of innovation is getting funded and not all of it's going to work, but I think there's a lot of exciting developments and, this is a space that's super early in its life cycle. I mean, you think about the end applications of AI ML, autonomous vehicles are probably the most advanced one, right? And a lot of other verticals are super early. And so I, I, think, I think it's really exciting how much emphasis and focus is, is kind of being brought to this category. Yeah, so Brian, here, here's something that, that we've been thinking about at Insight, maybe I'll kind of throw it out there and, and see what folks think. There, there's likely going to be some consolidation in the, you know, the space itself among the players that are in the space to some of the points that Matt made. 
But I also think there's going to be a limit in terms of the amount of consolidation of like the bigger players acquiring some of the smaller folks in the market because of like some of the regulatory aspects of what's um, effectively in the in the space right now. So like what was formerly Fang or I guess it's on Mang or whatever whatever it's now uh, labeled, uh, they actually are incapable of doing consolidation of the spaces even if they wanted to because of just how much regulatory pressure is preventing them from being able to make acquisitions at you know any scale or size right i mean like literally deals are getting held up just because it is a big company like a meta or an amazon etc and so I, I think that that to to dave's point will actually create a little bit more of a robust opportunity for a lot of these companies to grow um, some of them might be overfunded by you know VCs like ourselves, for sure. But at the near term, I think there will be just a nice ecosystem that'll be able to just grow without all the bigger players coming in and consolidating them per se. So there might be some inter-market consolidation, but there likely won't be a lot of big players coming in anytime soon to the space uh, because of some of the regulatory challenges that are out there. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, when I think about the consolidation, I think of it on two angles. One, you have actual acquisitions, so a larger company acquiring a smaller one. And then you have this other blurry version of consolidation, which is a company who is doing well and has a lot of funding that is adjacent to another category that is revenue generating will do that thing too. And so sure. it's still one company, but it's taking these different subcategories that are standalone uh, solutions and, cons and having the big players the, the big startups, I should say, the well-funded startups consolidate a lot of that functionality into their product. Um, and so I think when you think about if you're a founder in the space, my biggest piece of advice is find an injection point that is very strategic ground and is adjacent to a lot of other opportunities um, because that allows you to, you know, even if the thing you land with isn't the highest value thing in the long term, if you get that distribution and adoption, it buys you the funding and the usage to then go after the ones around it. Cause I think you're going to see a lot of that too. And you've started to see some of that in the data space, which I think is the, the more traditional data analytics space, which I think is just a little bit ahead of this uh, more machine learning based space. So I'm inclined to agree with you though on the bigger players, not um, being as acquisition heavy as perhaps historically. So one of the other questions that came up in the chat um, and we touched on briefly just to jump back a second is, uh, and, and you know, talking about differentiation for people in crowded markets is having a really fantastic team. Um, and I, I believe I, I'm trying to scroll through the chat to see the exact question, but it was something to the effect of, um, you know, what does that mean? Like, how do you think about what makes a great team, um, particularly in machine learning and AI, which I think is actually a little bit different the other categories given it is fairly nascent. There's a big research angle. A lot of the talents coming out of uh, more research oriented institutions. So um, within the context of a machine learning startup, what are the criteria that you think about when you analyze teams? Um, and maybe to, to flip the order here, we'll, we'll ask Matt first. Sure. So I look for the uh, intersection of three things. Uh, one, um, is that I look for uh, teams with real machine learning and AI shops, and um, you know, which seems obvious, but there there is a little bit of a you know thread, like whether that's you know in conversations or on Twitter or whatever, that um, you know AI is getting commoditized and TensorFlow and look at all those tools and all those things. So you know, it's 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 not that hard, and you can build companies um, you know leveraging AI without like a you know crazy deep ML team. I tend to disagree. Uh, I think that AI, especially when you build AI um, apps, as per the previous part of the conversation, I think it, I think AI building an AI company is still, uh, at least initially, much more of a deep tech effort than people realize. Uh, and therefore, on the teams that um, I get excited about, you tend to have people that have like really deep. Uh, knowledge of, of AI, so they, you know, whether they PhDs or not doesn't really matter. Whether they worked at like Facebook AI or wherever, it doesn't necessarily matter. Like you can you can evidence that in different ways, but that, that tends to be one key criteria for me. So that's one thing. The second thing is that I look for um, people that have strong engineering chops, 
Uh, so I think we've all seen over the years, like, you know, that amazing AI team where like, you know, like somebody comes from, uh, you know, Amazon or Google, whatever, like ultimately they get completely enamored with the AI problems that they are building and have a hard time translating into an actual product. Uh, so you need to have people that are very good at the algorithms, but also, uh, you know, can, can build a product as, as obvious as it sounds. Uh, it's not always the case. And then the third part um, for me is uh, teams that have a natural commercial inclination. So it doesn't mean that they are, uh, you know, uh, former salespeople, it doesn't mean that they are, you know, like the super extrovert uh, that um, like to sell day in and day out, but like it needs to be like people that um, uh, by default get excited about solving customer problems. Which again, you know, you would think, oh, this is kind of obvious, but um, again, like we've all met those very technical team where like the idea of doing marketing is very like against nature, like the idea of, uh, you know, uh, spending most of the time with a customer, you know, in some like obscure insurance company somewhere in the middle of the country doesn't actually get them that excited as opposed to doing some really cool AI. So there's an section of the three things. And I think, I think as we've all found out, uh, the, the intersection of like, the, those Venn diagrams actually pretty narrow so when you do find when when i find a team that meets all those uh, three criteria i get very excited very quickly maybe the other distinction i would add and i completely agree with matt here you know maybe the other distinction i would add is sort of like team as in founder versus team as in rest of the team you know i think like the, the things that you look for in an AIML founder are the same things you look for in all founders which is you know are they going to run through walls to make the product work do they understand the space really well do they have high degree of customer empathy they have like a, re a right to win, if you will, or a right to build in this space. So I, I think the traditional founder questions remain. The thing that's kind of interesting about AIML is this huge amount of talent shortage. And so one of the criteria that probably exists for an AIML founder that doesn't really exist for a traditional founder, or maybe it's just a different flavor of that is, can you attract these incredibly talented, high demand people? And can you build kind of an army of those folks within your company? And I think you're seeing this now, there's a consolidation of these type really talented individuals, they tend to cluster together. And so I think some of the best AIML founders are people who can build those clusters, attract those people, inspire those people to join them. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. And that's different from traditional software engineering where there's a larger pool of talent you can draw from. Maybe you find people who are specifically excited about your problem set versus kind of AIML. Yeah, I think you you all hit on all the same things that um, that I see. I think particularly, um, Matt, your comments on people who are commercially minded. I think lots of times you get people that are from a research background, and and research and you know commercialization are pretty different. Um, and it can't be underestimated how difficult go to market is in building a business, and particularly in something that's as nascent as machine learning. It's not like you know, if you're selling a database, people have been selling databases for 40 years. And so there might be some minor tweaks to the business model, but the foundational way of selling the thing is, is a solved problem. Um, I think similar to the technology, the strategies for go-to-market and machine learning and AI are, are rapidly developing as well. So you have to have an inherent knack and interest in, in cracking that problem. Um, the good news for engineers is that it's a system as well. So as long as you approach it from that way, you tend to have some pretty good success. Um, uh, jumping back again to something else that, uh, that came up briefly that I think is really interesting to talk about. We've, we've been talking a lot about some of the tooling side of things and how to think about the different injection points from a tooling perspective and all that. Um, but there's also been a lot of, as you mentioned, Matt, a lot of really interesting development on the application side. Um, David, you mentioned that you know, self-driving has been a place where there's been a lot of investment over the past, call it five to 10 years, um, more recently on the venture capital side, but in the research side for quite a while. Um, but there's been big developments in the past few years in language. There's been big developments in uh, life sciences. Um, so I'm curious for the group, are there any particular uh, more vertical applications of AI that are really exciting for you going into 2022? And uh, maybe George will will start off with you on this one. Yeah, I'll give a good example of uh, of an investment that I, I didn't personally make, but but we made as a firm at Insight just a few years back. And this one's this one's a fun one because the data accumulating um, is actually becoming more and more of a differentiator. Um, it's a company called Tractable, 
And what they literally do is auto claims insurance works uh, where, you know, right at the point of damage, you can take an image uh, picture on your smartphone of what that damage might be. And it immediately assesses using similar, you know, call it, um, you know, data that's been collected as far as a training model goes of assessing what are the likely events that have occurred for that specific type of damage. And more importantly, how much does it cost to go ahead and repair that uh, very easily and functionally and effectively adjudicates the claim right then and there. And so this is a pretty compelling mode right now in the insurance sector because you've had, you know, Tractable as an organization start to build up this corpus of knowledge in terms of what is uh, damage, to what extent is a claim necessary and how much of that claim um, is is not only valid, but but how much is it is that damage um, being assessed at, and and that's been built over the last call it three and a half four years or so, and it's now starting to differentiate a company like that in that space. And a lot of Matt's earlier comments on this this vertical opportunity that might exist where you know you might not even know there's an AI system under the covers, but it's actually creating um, a differentiation in the market um, is pretty clear. In an example like Tractable, there's there's hundreds of others, or at least you know at least 20, 30 others. But um, that's one of my more recent favorite ones that is kind of getting runaway success in their specific market. Yeah, and how do y'all think about um, analyzing which vertical markets are an attractive one for uh, an, a vertical AI app? Right. Well, the challenge, for example, with self driving, and the reason it's taken so long is it's an extraordinarily open domain. Right. And so there's a tremendous amount of money to be made to build a car that drives itself. But the time horizon is quite long, especially for a venture backed business where you're trying to look for returns in a more short period of time. Now, the valuation of those companies has obviously risen because people can see the long term market opportunity. Um, but I'm curious if you have any frameworks, given machine learning is being applied to so many different verticals. If there's a framework that you use as you're thinking through opportunities to identify verticals that are more or less attractive? I mean, I think one frame, and this is how we've thought about it a little bit, is every vertical SaaS company is gonna have to embed AI to their products. It's almost like when you talked about FinTech and payments and how payments affected vertical SaaS, you don't think about now, you know, service titan as a, as a FinTech business per se, you think of it as a vertical SaaS business that sort of embeds a FinTech opportunity. And I think you're gonna see something similar throughout the, the vertical SaaS space, now, I think some of that will come from incumbents and some of that will come from new disruptors we will think of as vertical AI businesses. And so if you are natively started from scratch as an AI business in a vertical, I think we'll think of, and I think there'll be a lot more of those. And there's good reason to believe that incumbents are not going to necessarily be best in class at embedding this innovation in their products. But I think at the same time, we're going to see a lot of vertical AI innovation within existing vertical platforms and vertical products. And I think especially as the underlying infrastructure becomes easier to use and more and more software engineers can do machine learning, I think we're going to see it become a more standard part of kind of the software development toolkit for all of these companies. And we're going to start to expect these type of capabilities in a lot of our products. And I think it will happen slowly and take us by surprise where I think you, you, you imagine today that when you walk into a store, the cameras know who you are and they're identifying that and, and using that information, but they're, they're not, right? A lot of this stuff doesn't actually happen today. Uh, a lot of the things that we imagine could happen. And so I think a lot of that stuff is gonna, is gonna come over the next few years and, and we're just at the inflection point of that. To, to, to Dave's last point about like things move slowly and then and and then they accelerate in the background, I'll give you a really fun example um, more recently. So everyone who's maybe used one of those um, sort of recent check-ins that you do um, online for an airline flight, they have entire trip center experience, for instance, like an organization like United, um, they're doing heavy amounts of NLP document matching AI first systems to be able to just understand like all of the right requirements necessary for all the right documents to be in the right place at the right moment for that person to get on the plane at any moment in time. And like that was a, a very archaic, you know, uh, non-existent capability prior. And now you've now built a called AI first system to be able to manage that entire process in a relatively seamless way for us to all be able to get on planes and manage our documents um, you know, pretty effectively and in a system that frankly didn't even exist not more than about a year and a half ago. And so you're starting to see these things kind of be you know, 
part of the way that we function inside of like some of these key industries and the use of, of AI based technology um, to be kind of first leverage in these prime use cases that, you know, we've never had to kind of imagine before. And, and, you know, it starts slowly to, to Dave's last point, but it starts to sell like pretty quickly, you know, even in this, in the use of like something like a travel center by United. And to be along that, like I, you know, the question to me is whether in 10 years from now we'll still be talking about AI in the enterprise, not because AI will have failed, but because AI will have succeeded and therefore disappeared in the background, right? So just, just the way today you don't talk about, oh, I'm investing in this like database, database first company, uh, you know, like people like us or us in 10 years, hopefully will not be saying, hey, we like investing in AI first companies, right? Well, the, 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 the the weird thing about success of uh, you know for for technology is that uh, you, you go into like a ubiquity and then you just disappear in the background and I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. You also already see um, to George's point some of these. Uh, there's already tons of cases in your day to day life where you're using machine learning. You probably just don't realize it, right? Like every time you take a photo on your phone, you're like, wow, this looks amazing. It's like because it's being run through a fairly complicated system. Uh, and it's, in order it's to, a joke, right? Like when, when, when people say, what is AI? AI is always a thing in the future. Like the fact that you have like ways that you like, or, you know, Google Maps that you use like all the time for traffic directions or that like Google Photos like auto categorizes your images and recognizes your kids. That, that's not AI, that's just what it does, right? Like, you know, like our, our expectation of what AI is keeps adjusting as AI becomes ubiquitous in everything we do. Yeah, yeah. And perhaps the lesson here is that, you know, when people think about AI and ML, they think about the extreme. Right, like a self-driving car is an extreme application of machine learning, yeah. um, and it's the small things that slowly build up to the big thing. And you know, if you didn't have dial-up internet, you wouldn't have the iPhone. And it's you're constantly surprised how short the time frame between the two ends up being. For sure. Um, well, great. I know we've only got a couple more minutes here, um, so I'd love to shift gears a little bit. Uh, to do some some predictions you know I, I alluded to the fact that someone asked me this question last week and i thought it was kind of a fun question so uh maybe to close things out we can go around the room and say uh what are your well we'll do two last questions the first one will be uh what is the biggest piece of advice that you have for someone hoping to found a machine learning company in 2022 that you've learned from maybe 2021 or or the year before and in terms of order, uh, David will let you kick us off. Yeah, I've got to start with the, the, this predictions, but okay. Um, you know, I think for, in terms of new companies, I, I think a lot of folks right now, when I talk to kind of new founders, I think a lot of folks say, hey, you know, there's this like one piece, piece of the stack that I feel like is missing and I'm going to go after that and I'm just going to go solve this, this problem. And I think, I actually think, especially in the beginning, the best companies are founded by this kind of a more exploratory, like, what are the problems I'm trying to solve? What are the things that I run into every, every day? And, and how do you kind of build a workflow around that? And so I think there's been a, you know, investors, especially, we maybe are, are most guilty of this, of like segmenting the world into there's this, this piece and there's that piece. And I don't know that the, the ML stack is going to map one-to-one -one onto the software development ecosystem. And so I think there's just, I think there's going to be new businesses that get created that you never even thought of. And Hugging Face is a great example of this, right? I mean, who would have guessed that this chat bot that this, these guys started was going to turn into the amazing business that it is today and that all these practitioners in the, in the world were going to start using this and contributing and contributing back to the ecosystem. So I think, I think there's going to be a lot more starting an ML company is probably a bit more roundabout or maybe all starting all companies is pretty roundabout, I guess, but I think there's going to be a lot of exploration that happens uh, as folks start these companies. Do you want me to do the predictions or are we going to do this and then the predictions? What do you, how do you want to do it, Brian? Let's do this and then we'll close out with the predictions. Cool. We actually have, uh, I thought we had two more minutes, but we have seven, so we can, we can cover a little more ground. Uh, Matt, you wanna go next? Uh, in terms of like advice for a founder? Yeah. Uh, look, I, th I think, so, so first of all, uh, do it. If you, if, you wanna, if you wanna start something, you should do it. It's an extraordinary moment in time to start companies uh, where this, you know, talent, this capital, this energy, like, you know, by all means do it. 
Um, but at the same time, I would spend uh, a lot of time very carefully thinking about the problem that you're trying to solve. And the reason for that is that they just, as we discussed earlier, like in the last couple of years, there's been like this massive increase in velocity in terms of like the no number of companies that were created and, and, and all the things. Uh, and uh, the, the bar is just a bit higher. Um, you know, not necessarily in terms of getting funding, but in terms of uh, succeeding. So it's worth um, uh, carefully planning, uh, planning ahead, and like really thinking about the, the the problem, whether that's a tool or whether that's uh, that's an application. On the on the application front, uh, still in the same vein of the product, um, there was like a whole generation of of companies that um, I think took too much of a deep tech risk in um, the problem they were trying to solve. So like you can argue whether self-driving falls in that category or not. But um, like in general, AI is not great uh, at solving problems that need to be solved 100% of the time, 100% right, uh, especially in real time. You can build those companies, but like you end up with like an awkward mix between um, tech and humans in the loop, and the unit economics tend to not work very well. So I would select a problem where uh, the fact that uh, your AI model is right 92% of the time is a great thing and not a terrible disaster. Yeah, I think the... the um the folks already have, have mentioned like how good of a time to get Matt was mentioning how good of a time it is to start a company this this present you know day and I, I would recommend for anyone who is you know even remotely considering it to do it now like don't even wait till the new year just do it now get going and I think for anyone who is starting particularly an AI first company at least in this moment in time it is an interesting uh, shift to now have really good tools, right? It's like, you don't need to go build a lot of the deep tooling to be successful any longer, right? Like that work has been done, particularly in the last two to three years, where particularly as you're going after that vertical use case, that you know, specific application that you wanna to bring to market, you can bring that to market way faster with great tools in your hands, uh, particularly with the, um, the companies that have really focused on the ML ops space in the last, you know, 18 to 24 months. Yeah, I think great advice. I, I think mine would be uh, start small and be pragmatic because I think a lot of, there's a lot of cool things you could do with machine learning and AI in the long term, but you got to start small. Um, kind of to your point, Matt, I think sometimes people try to solve the big hard problem and wake up two or three years later and go, oh, the asymptote of, you know, <laughs> it's going to take us a long time to get there. Um, well, with our last three minutes, we'll give one minute per person. We'll go in the same order, starting with you, David. The last question, 2022, going to be a big year. Hopefully, we'll be more opened up. It looks like we're closing back down right now. But what's your big prediction for machine learning and AI uh, in 2022? Or what are you most excited about is perhaps a different flavor. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I have any crazy cr predictions in 2022. Maybe, if anything, I think AI is one of these things that's, you know, it's a 10-year, it's going to be a 10-year story. And I don't know that 2022 will be fundamentally different from 2021, which is maybe that itself is a controversial opinion. I don't know. Um, one thing I do think is, is that I'm excited for, and I think it's interesting, is I think the number of AI practitioners were printing out, you know, every college every year is printing out in an exponential way the, the number of AI practitioners that are going to exist in the world. And so every year, I feel like just naturally the number of the addressable audience, the addressable market for the space is growing at an incredibly rapid clip. And so I think one of the things I'm most excited for is, you know, the, the new graduates, like the new university students who are coming out of this who are, and the things that they're going to build and the new talent that's going to come into this space. And I think it's really invigorating and energizing when you know every year going into the next year, we're just printing out more and more users who are going to be building around this ecosystem. And so that's something that I'm really excited about for, for next year. So one of the things I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to is this, this hyper acceleration towards a, a data centric versus model centric world, particularly in the in the AI sort of uh, schools that we're all in. I think um, we've had quite a few years where it's really mattered, like the bespoke nature of the models that we're building. And I think now we're seeing with examples of even the NLP space with what they've called out with, with Augment Face, like you can now plug in all kinds of advancements in model development, particularly in the NLP world with one uniform consistent transformer layer with um, Hugging Face. And I think we're, we're starting to see that across a number of these subdomains around AI and machine learning that 
we're, we're entering a moment where we move from a model centric to a data centric world. And that acceleration is something that, that particularly excites me. One, one piece of that acceleration to a data centric world, you know, um, indicates that, you know, as much as Snowflake has gotten big as a structured data warehouse for data in terms of, you know, analytical workloads on, on structured information, why isn't there a snowflake like opportunity in the sort of unstructured world, particularly when it comes to sort of AI first problems. And I think that's a huge opportunity that's still untackled that I haven't quite seen anyone quite figure out how to build, call it the snowflake for unstructured data. So I'm pretty excited to see that emerge. And uh, what I'm excited uh, for, which, um, you know, may start next year, may accelerate, maybe uh, a, a trend is the simplification and democratization of AI. I think right now we've been in that phase where everything is getting more complicated and, you know, again, like to that mad landscape I did, like, like you know, there's like categories, subcategories, sub subcategories, and like all of those are very, you know, nascent complicated tools and like people build expertise around like that little tool versus that other, other little tool, right? Um, I, for, for the whole space to succeed, uh, that cannot be the end uh, state. So I think we, in this phase of like zooming in right now into like all the little problems, but like for, you know, success needs, for success truly to happen, we need to over time zoom out and things need to be simplified, compatible, modular, uh, all, all those things. And I, I think that's going to happen over the next uh, few years. It's already happening to, to, to some extent, but I think that's going to accelerate. Awesome. Well, fantastic conversation. We're, we're right at time here, but uh, George, Matt, David, thank you all so much for, for the time. This was a super great chat and hopefully the audience learned a little thing or two. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Brian. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it.